So today we are here at the Anglo-Australian Telescope joined by James Cameron. Now, James, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role here at the AAT? Yes, I'm a night assistant and operations technician. What I do at night is to keep everything working and help the observers use the telescope. So the observers sit here or they're on Zoom and they give me directions and I make sure everything's safe and I open up and catch the light from the sky and uh, they then analyse it. Uh, during the day I'm here to fix things oh, sure. and so I, I, we take turns. We're a part of a large team which does that. Okay, that's really interesting because this of course is an optical telescope. The night time is obviously very, very important for capturing these scientific images that yep. the astronomers are needed for. I wasn't really aware of the daytime aspect of um, a telescope or an optical telescope either. Could you yep. tell us a bit more about what you do, what needs to be fixing? <laughs> well, the main thing during the day is to keep everything closed so that everything stays cold. And so part of our job is to make sure the temperatures are cold so that when we open up everything looks good so the stars don't twinkle in a way that disturbs the science. Apart from that, we're, we're using equipment right on the edge of their specified use. You know, things are... Well, this is science, this is not manufacturing. So um, things tend not to work after a while and we might have to go in and plug something in or take it out and change it and that sort of thing. So. We have a mechanical team which manages all the, the shutter and the dome equipment. We have someone who looks after the cooling system. We have people who look after the spectrographs, people who look after the IT systems. Mm -hmm. So we all work together, have a morning meeting and make sure that everything works ready for the next night. Sure, there's so much more going into it than I guess I really appreciated, uh, you know, being on the astronomer side of things. Could you tell us a little bit more about your your technical skill set? Uh, by the sounds of it, you're, you're very handy, um, and I think that's putting it lightly. Could you tell us a bit about your journey in, in how you, you gain these skills? Well, I, I was um, a science nut in school and kept top in the class until my classmates said that was a bad idea, I should try less hard. Um, <laughs> And the school in Sydney was right next to a, um, a CSIRO facility which did radio astronomy. And so at lunchtime or during work experience, I'd pop across there and see how things were done. Um, and so I had a great advantage in that respect. But mainly I think it was my parents who let me play with stuff, technical stuff, and told me about it and taught me how to fix problems. That's where it really came from. So in order for one astronomer to be able to use this facility, um, say over, over a duration of a night, how many people behind the scenes are there supporting that astronomer? Yep. Um, you know, even beyond that night, how many people are, are contributing to, to maintaining a facility like this in order for us to be able to mm, do that yes. science? Roughly, roughly 10 to 15 people. Yeah. Um, it depends on what's gone wrong. <laughs> um, but the, there's also the, the people who built the instrument in the first place. Hundreds of people were, were involved in building the telescope and the instruments that are used. And so um, if you look further back in time, over 30 years, you mm. could say that it's actually the work of thousands of people. Mm. And it's, it's a sort of pinnacle of, of human achievement, if you like, that, that, we, that we're able to keep this thing running so that science can continue to be done. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. You touched on uh, this idea that what's happening here really is is kind of pushing the boundaries and, and really at the, the cutting edge of, of using the, the technology that we have access to here. Could you kind of talk a bit more about that? Um, what you what advancements you've kind of seen in your time here and maybe touch on what you see coming in the future? Yes, OK. Um, well, when you look at the control panel behind me, it's a mix of technology from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all out to the 2000s. And it's not something you normally see in, in other contexts. You normally have everything at the same technology level. Mm -hmm. But when something works here, we keep it working mm -hmm. as long as we can, because the cost to replace it is very high. 
Um, so there are some really new things in this building that have only come in in the last few years, and they're surprisingly new sort of technologies. One of them is a thing called a laser comb, which produces light um, in lots of different colours, but with gaps between the colours. So that when you look at, at it on a spectrum, it looks like a comb. And so that's why it's called a laser comb. So that's really advanced technology, and that's carefully locked away because it's you know, slightly risky, and also we don't want it to break. And we use that for one of the instruments. So there's this great mixing of very old and very new technology, and so therefore we have the skills to handle both types of technology. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think what a lot of different places would ideally like to do, even you know, within my own home, I'd love to be able to you know, fix things instead of replacing it. We, we are often pushed to, uh, you know, to buy new things and to um, replace things, but obviously that's not very sustainable. Uh, and, and we're, and as you mentioned, really expensive to do. So I think that's fantastic and, and something that we should really be all trying to do wherever we are.